What's going on guys, Mike here, the Detroit Boar, covering a product I never really expected to see from Apple, and that is a book. So this book is entitled Designed by Apple in California, and it's available in two sizes, 10.2 by 12.8 or 13 by 16.3. So that retails for $199, or $2.99. That's quite expensive, although that's not unusual for high-end books from architecture to fashion or art. Apple says this was printed on specially milled German paper with gilded matte silver edges, which sort of reflects their aluminum design aesthetic. It uses eight color separation and low ghost inks, so the colors are extremely vibrant on this book. It really shows off in some of the pages. These are also extremely heavy books. You can tell they're using very heavyweight paper. There's 300 pages here and 450 images covering 20 years of Apple design history. So really, this doesn't cover the complete history of Apple. It really starts off when Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive started working together back when Steve returned to the company. So getting to the unboxing, both of them do come in these nice white containers and you can easily open them by pulling the tab toward the center. Now starting off with the smaller book, once we get the box out of the way, we have the book wrapped in paper. The wrapper itself is actually very cleverly designed. So once you unhook it all, it just opens up. The wrapper itself also has a lot of really neat images on the inside, including some surprises like the iPhone 5C case which I don't think is a celebrated design, but uh, maybe it is at Apple, I'm not sure. Before we start flipping through the pages, let's get to the bigger book, and it is really big, so I have to get my camera up higher here to see it, but the unboxing and unwrapping experience is identical. So when it comes to the size difference, the bigger one is absolutely huge and extremely heavy. This is really meant for a coffee table, while the smaller size is a little more conventional, it's a little easier to handle, but you definitely wanna go for the bigger one if you want the most detail in your images. But the attention to detail and the quality here is definitely notable. So for example, the pages come up to the edges of the book and the covers themselves vary in thickness depending on which size you get. So you can see the bigger book has a thicker cover compared to the smaller book. The covers themselves are wrapped in linen with an embossed Apple logo toward the center. Again, a different size depending on the book. And the title of the book is also embossed on the spine. Now flipping through the books, the first thing you'll see here is just a lot of white space. It's extremely minimal. Usually you see all sorts of information at the front of the book. The first text of the book toward the top of the page is designed by Apple in California. So that refers both to the title and the book itself. The second page is a dedication to Steve Jobs. The third page is an introduction by Johnny Ive. So next up, let's just start walking through this book and explore some of the pages together. So the first thing we see here is the first generation of the iMac, which was part of the renaissance of Apple when Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive started working together. And the design here is very typical of the 90s because it influenced a lot of products with that clear translucent plastic and those bright vivid colors. And you'll see this throughout some other Apple products and there were many variations of this iMac as it went along. We also have the iBook, a product I never really liked, but again, it was one of the new products that came along with Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive. We also have the cinema display, again, that translucent plastic, although it looks a little less flashy here. The Cube was one of the most celebrated products, but it was not successful. It's very expensive and hard to configure, but it was a neat product in any case because you could separate the internals from the casing. We also have one of the speakers that came with that system, which was also translucent, including the Pro Mouse, which was an optical mouse that was wired, but again, had that translucent material. And the speaker design, that subwoofer that came with the Pro Max were also kind of unique. We also have the Power Mac G4, which was actually the first Mac I used in college. I spent a lot of time behind one. We also have that Titanium PowerBook G4. This is a computer I never used. This was well before my time before I started buying Apple products. We also have one of the most important consumer products in recent history, and that is the iPod, the original one that came out in 2001. And it does highlight some of the manufacturing processes used to create that polished back panel. And to this day, it's one of my favorite Apple products. Also, one of my favorite Mac designs of all time is the G4 iMac, which had this articulating armature, which allowed you to position the screen to any place you want. It was a very neat design. And of course, we have the eMac, which had a flat CRT tube, which was dying out at this time, but it was a neat design and inexpensive and it appeared a lot in classrooms. We also have one of my favorite iPods as well, the third generation, which had those touch controls. And then we got the updated PowerBook G4s in 2003. And you can see the two sizes that were available and the manufacturing processes they used to create it. 
We also have the EyeSight camera. So this is when they started adding cameras to the computer. It was huge by today's standards, but it was a nice piece of hardware. And then we have the Cheese Grater Mac Pro, which lasted for a very long time until we finally got the cylindrical Mac Pro, which once again has been abandoned as well. Of course, the G5 Tower is a lot more flexible than the Mac Pro we have today. Also in 2003, we got our first wireless Apple keyboard, which had these very large keys. You wouldn't recognize this keyboard on any Apple product today. In 2003, we got the iBook G4, in addition to the travel charger we're all familiar with today. We also got the iPod Mini, the first shrunken down iPod, and it lasted only one generation before it was replaced by the iPod Nano. We also got some accessories I didn't know existed, including a lanyard. We also have the first in-ear style headphones from Apple, which I don't think many people know about, but I actually have a set of these. In 2004, we got a new cinema display, which was all aluminum, and it came with a design that we would later see on the new iMacs. We also got the fourth generation iPod, which added a color screen for the first time. And it's also the first iPod to travel to space, which is why the shuttle is represented. In 2004, we got one of the first iMacs with a flat style all-in-one design. And I didn't really like this one just because it looks so chunky and it was made out of plastic, just the base was aluminum. But again, this book does highlight many of the ways in which these things are manufactured. Another accessory are the iPod socks, which I'm surprised are being represented here, but that was an important product for them at the time. And then we also have the first generation iPod shuffle, which was quite a bit bigger than the one today, but it did come with a lanyard you can carry around. I also have the first generation iPod Nano, and you can see how it was manufactured at the time. And my first iPod, which was the iPod Video or the fifth generation iPod. We also have a product that they spend a lot of time here in this book, which is the iPod Hi-Fi. This is actually something I've always wanted to pick up, but I definitely don't need it. But it was designed to be an audio system that docked with your iPod. It doesn't work today, obviously, because it uses the 30 pin dock, uh, but it is a really neat accessory. And it was something that uh, Apple really pushed at the time, but never really took off. We also got the first MacBook in 2008, which was an all plastic design. And then we got our second generation iPod Nano, which came in some very vibrant colors. The second generation iPod Shuffle adopted this aluminum clip-on design and came in all these vibrant colors. We also got a second generation of those in-ear style headphones, which had replaceable tips and a carrying case. And of course, the device that deserves the most pages here, I think, is the first generation iPhone, also known as the iPhone 2G. This was one of my first Apple products and definitely my first smartphone. And I absolutely loved it. There was nothing like it at the time. It was great to have a full web browser. You really take it for granted now, but at the time, this was a huge deal. And actually, one of my favorite pages here and one of the most surprising is this very weathered look at the original iPhone. The 2007 iPhone also brought us new headphones along with an inline remote control and microphone. We also got a new iMac in 2007. This was actually the first iMac I owned, although I bought it in 2009, but that generation had carried on with that design for a few years. And you can see how it was manufactured. It also had a very familiar keyboard, which survived up until the Magic Keyboard just recently. We also got the third generation iPod Nano, which was quite different than the others that preceded it or succeeded it. And then we had the first generation iPod Touch based on the first generation iPhone. We also got the final iPod Classic. That's the sixth generation iPod. It was also one of my first unboxings on YouTube. We also got that first generation MacBook Air, which was not a terribly successful product, but it did pave the way for the second generation that would become very successful. Of course, we have the iPhone 3G, which was the second generation iPhone. We went from aluminum to all plastic, and we did have a 3GS version as well. I never really liked this design, but it was definitely more practical. Of course, Apple would revisit plastic later, and that didn't turn out too well for them. And you can see the manufacturing process for creating the frame, which was part of strengthening that plastic shell. We also have the second generation iPod Touch with that very scratchable polished surface. And then in 2008, we got the new LED cinema display, which had this all aluminum body. This would later be updated to the Thunderbolt display, which was the last one before it was discontinued. Also in 2008, we got the all new aluminum MacBook, which had an infrared receiver on the front. We had a removable battery compartment with a lever. It was a really neat design. And you can see the exploded version on how this was created and milled out of a single piece of aluminum. We also got a third generation iPod Shuffle, which was very short lived. This was not a very popular design because it was somewhat difficult to use. In 2009, the iMac picked up an all aluminum unibody design and some new peripherals, including the Magic Mouse replacing the Mighty Mouse. We also got a trackpad and a new keyboard. In 2009, we got a redesigned white plastic MacBook. This was the budget MacBook at the time. In 2009, we got the fifth generation iPod Nano, which had a larger screen for video, along with a camera that was only good for recording video, not photographs. And in 2009, we got the first generation iPad, which is huge compared to today's iPad. and also was very short lived and only lasted one year. 
In 2010, we got one of my favorite iPhone designs, which was the iPhone 4 with that glass and metal frame. And of course, that did lead to antenna gate, and it does show you how those antenna bands were designed. And of course, you see all the tools as well for milling out all of those products. You see some of the testing used to test the glass on the iPhones. And the cases, this was the bumper case for the iPhone, which they gave away after antenna gate. They also spend quite a few pages on the very compact Mac Mini, although they spend no time on the original Mac Mini, unfortunately. And basically, they're showing you that this is made out of one piece of aluminum. The sixth generation iPod Nano adopted a clip-on design just like the iPod Shuffle, and the iPod Shuffle went back to a design that was more user-friendly. We also got a fourth generation iPod Touch, which added a camera for the first time. We also got the second generation Apple TV, and there is no reference to the first generation in here, but of course the second generation Apple TV also came with a really neat all aluminum remote controller. Perhaps one of the most important MacBooks ever to come out is the second generation MacBook Air, and of course we got the thinner iPad 2. The iPad 2 also introduced the smart cover, which is a very clever design, and another surprising uh, image here is a worn in leather smart cover. We also got some updated MacBook Pros in 2012, which of course got thinner. And that also came with a new MagSafe 2 connector, which was used up until recently. Of course, we also have the new AirPods and their carrying case with a remote control and microphone. And personally, I actually really like these headphones. We also get another image demonstrating how they manufacture the molds for the AirPods. We also have a seventh generation iPod Nano. This is probably the last Nano we'll ever see. Uh, so it's nice to see it featured here. In 2012, we got the fifth generation iPod Touch with Lightning and the iPod Loop accessory. In 2012, we got an all new iMac with a razor thin edge. This would later be updated for 5K and 4K displays. Now skipping a generation, we jumped to the iPhone 5S, which had a fingerprint sensor called Touch ID. The iPhone 5 is also the first to get a lightning connector. It's the first to grow in size from 3.5 to 4 inches. And of course, it was the first Apple product to come in gold. Of course, Apple started making a lot of accessories for the iPhones, including these leather cases, and they highlight how those are manufactured. And of course, I've covered quite a few of them in the past. And something I'm surprised to see here is the iPhone 5C and its specific case, which was never really liked. We also got the first iPad Air in 2012, which is a razor thin design that got even thinner with the second generation. And of course it came along with some updated smart covers, which were felt lined so they didn't scratch the iPad like the previous hinge did. We also got some smart cases, which fully protected the iPads and integrated a smart cover. We also get this huge section dedicated to the Mac Pro, which is kind of interesting because they're not doing a very good job maintaining it lately. But again, it's one of my favorite designs. It's one of my favorite products I've ever unboxed. It's a great design. It's not a great piece of hardware today just because it's so outdated. But the manufacturing process and the design is very unique. It's not everybody's favorite because it's not a great tool. Uh, but again, it's a really interesting design. 2014 was one of the most significant years for the iPhone because we got two new sizes, which dramatically increased the size over the previous generation. Also in 2014, we got the thinner iPad Air 2. Now, obviously a very important product for the design team was the Apple Watch. So there is a huge section here dedicated just to the Apple Watch and its various finishes and bands. And I'm sure this was a significant design challenge for the engineering team. And of course they want to highlight this here. You also see some of the internal hardware and how they test and manufacture the entire product. And of course they worked with a lot of materials for the Apple Watch from sapphire glass to gold. As we get toward the end, we also get the MacBook, the 12.9 inch MacBook, one of my favorite Macs today. We also have the 12.9 inch iPad Pro and its keyboard accessory in addition to the Apple Pencil. Now, if you want to know more details about the images, there is a portable glossary in the back of the book that you can remove and then refer to as you flip through the book. Ultimately, I think it's pretty clear that this book really is intended as a gift item for this holiday. So it makes perfect sense that it's coming out in two different sizes and prices. But of course, this is really geared toward Apple fans or people who just love really nice books. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up to let me know and I'll see you again in the next video.